remember when uh, I was a kid, I was uh, grade two, well, not so much of a kid, but really, um, I was quite jealous of my classmates because every Saturday, they would go out and they would go biking. This was about grade two, and I didn't have a bike, so I remember going to my dad and, says, and, and say, you know, dad, all of my friends have bikes. Can I have a bike? And my, bro my father said, well, you know what, son? I love you, but it's not your birthday. <laughs> So I went to the next one, which, you know, what every son would do, go to the mother and say, Mom, we're closer. And you know what dad did? You know, all my friends have bikes, and I want a bike to feel belonged. I want to be part of the group. And my mom said, well, son, it's not Christmas. There are many things in the world that I, I wanted, but even the people closest to me was very difficult to ask things from. And so really, when I, when I grew up, uh, I realized this. And, and one of the things that, that I also experienced during that, 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 that time was the fact that, you know, so there I was, desperate, and all my friends had bikes, and I went to the canteen, and I saw this woman with, uh, with a thick wad of, of, of pesos. And I asked her, how did, you, how did you get this money? And she said, well, in the morning, there's this big truck of chippy that comes over, snack foods, and then I buy it, and then I put a little price over it, I put a little more money over it, and then when I sell it, whatever's whatever's left is, is, is mine, so that's my profit. So the next day I had some money, and uh, I went there uh, with the chippy, I, I was able to get it, I put it under my desk, and I remember counting down uh, the time to recess, and when it rang, I ran to the back of the classroom, I locked it, and I said, nobody go to the canteen, I have chippy. And, and I remember that was the first profit I made, and so there, there were many things in life I could not control, but to make business, to make money, that was one thing I did, and uh, a month and a half later, I had, I had that bike. And so there, when I was, when I was studying uh, in, in, uh, for, uh, in political administration, one of the things that I had the most difficulty with was understanding that most of my time working in a charity was actually trying to get money. And then we would spend it, and then I would do it again. 100 people hungry, I would try to get 100 baskets of food, and then what do you think happens next week? 200 people are hungry. And so a lot of the time was just going circular. And I said, it's impossible to do something that is so linear. When there's a problem, I would go out and try to fix that problem. But then with escalating poverty, you need an escalating solution. So my dream was this. Instead of everything coming up, you know, big problems, big solutions, I was thinking, what if everybody could do something? What if we can make this NGO 2.0 that anybody around the world could do something with very little money. And so that was it. So the three rules that, ha that had to follow us. First of all, everything must be available to them, even the poorest. So not only the people with money, but the poorest. Second is that everything could be done with basic carpentry skills. And third, that it must be a business. So what I wanted from is instead of top-down, where charity would come down and be expended, can there be a new kind of model wherein we could use this kind of viral solutions with this kind of reaching out with a social network? So that was the dream. And so what we had to do is really look in the world, what's, what's the most available stuff to just about everybody, just even the poor? So we were looking at plastic bags, we are looking at cans, we were looking at glass bottles, but one thing that kept on coming up that just really could not destroy, it was just almost indestructible, more than a thousand years, was really this plastic bottle. And so what we said was, can we change the world with a plastic bottle? Something that people overlook, something that everybody can use, but really something that could be built, something that could be used and taught and at, at the same time uh, accessed by everyone with the right kind of information. And so what we wanted to do is, in a world full of garbage, can something with, that's so much of a big problem, can that be a great solution? And so me and my friends, we started using plastic bottles. We started gathering them. Uh, we asked them to fill it up with soil. And after that, we started getting more friends, filling it up with more soil, and stacking them up. And we built something that was lacking in the world at half the cost, four times stronger than normal, normal hollow blocks that were filled with sand and it would easily be, get destroyed. The 14-inch thick walls would actually be uh, safe in, in terms of storms, but the nice thing there is this ability to build huge classrooms out of plastic bottles. 
every... Can something so overlooked, you know, instead of going for the big time, you know, big trucks, big technology, big donation, can we just go the other way, which is human scale, easy to, easy to do, but at the same time, really could be something that the community can access even without this kind of donations. So that was what we were, we, we were so in love with. Can this be applied anywhere in the country and anywhere in the world that needed classrooms? So turning new schools, uh, turning old bottles into new schools. And so far we built about 40 and the best thing there is we're not actually there. What we do is we teach them, but really it's the people there, farmers, uh, fishermen, that are actually our construction workers because it's so easy to do. And so the profit does not go to some outside contractor, especially on the islands that it costs so much to build, but actually stays with the people there. And they bid out and because it can be done, at one third of the cost, they always win their bids. Source of light. One of the biggest problems really in a developing country is this, that we just think that you know, everybody has light, but actually the fact is it's so expensive, especially in the Philippines, we're the most expensive in Asia when it comes to light, that people have light. And so the thing there is most of people do not because you know, the, the houses are so close next to each other even though you have a window, it's so close, light doesn't come in. Second also, it's just, you know, when you, you turn on the lights during the day and during the night, most of the lines, uh, most of the electricity bills get so high that they're cut. And so two things happen. Either they try to connect it during the evening, and then of course you have this cat and mouse chase with the utility companies, or what they do is they have that kerosene lamp, or even worse, a candlelight. So if everybody starts using these candles to go to the bathroom, to go to the kitchen, what do you think happens at a certain point? It's just a huge amount of people's houses are getting burned. So what we wanted to do, again, was try to figure out how we can turn this expensive light that everybody has to live or else you stay in darkness into something that could give unlimited light. And that's where the solution came. How can you convert bottles into light? And so when we were building the plastic bottle schools, one of the things we learned was we were building it the Western style, which was we were building it you know, cheaply or more economically, but no light was going in. And so what we started to do is between the earthen blocks, we started putting plastic bottles. And I'd like to t teach you, I'd like to tell you a little bit about this, but the nice thing there is we don't also build it, we empower people to do it themselves. And I'm gonna show you this video about one man, five months ago, he had no job, simple carpentry skills, but now he has lit more than 8,000 houses with this business model. Yung lugar namin, uh, Sitio Maligaydos, San Vicente, San Pedro Laguna. Eh, siyempre, alam mo naman, ganitong lugar, squatter area, tabing rilis, dikit-dikit ang bahay. Madilim talaga rito sa lugar ko na to. Wala kami dito sa loob, lagi kami sa labas. Nadadapa, kasi madilim, yung dadaan mo, hindi mo alam, may nakaharang. Tutulog na lang ako, lailaw eh. Ang tawag nila sa akin dito ay si Mang Dimi Solar. Napaliwanag ko yung mga bahay nila magdilim. Bubutas ka ng yero, lalagay mo yung buti, lagyan mo siya ng sealant, bago lagyan mo siya ng tubig na mineral, sa lagyan ng sunrox. Bago kabit mo sa bahay, lagyan mo sealant mo para hindi tumulo. Ganyan lang kasimple yun. Dati yung ganyan tukang dilim nung bago pagkakabitan. Ngayon, nung kapitan ko na, ito na ang liwanag niya. Ito na ang liwanag. Umili po ako kasi bote lang, tubig. Maliwanag na yung bahay mo. Umaba yung ano ko, binayaran ko ngayon. Simula lang makabitan ako dito. At saka itong solar bottle bag na to, hindi mainit. Dahil sa bote na yan, sa solar na bote na yan, gumanda ang araw na yan. Ang nalagyan na namin ito ay bali... 643. Gusto nga namin tuloy-tuloy para marami nga matulong ang mga tao rin na ano, yung maliwanagay ang mga bahay nilang madilim. Parang katulad na rin ng bumbilya. Yung dati natin nakakalimutan na pa kinabahan na ngayon. 
So, the point is, while we're waiting for these green technologies to be high-tech, manufactured elsewhere, has to come in from expensive factories, while less than 1% of populations in developing countries are actually benefiting, why don't we come up with our own thing? Why do we have to wait for technology to come down? Why can't we give power to the people? Solar-powered solar bulbs. And so there, anywhere in the world, you give the technology up on the web, make it open source, use the internet to reach as many people as possible, pass it on, tell people how to do it, and guess what? Within five short months, you have plastic bottles, pieces of metal, you have people selling it. Imagine, instead of it being imported, now it's human-powered. It's built by human hands. Uh, communities build it. At the same time, they sell it. Sir, do you want to build a solar bulb? 15 rupees. Do you want it installed? 15 rupees. Guess who makes the money? Green jobs for the poorest. Uh, we use unemployed people to build it. They gather it from restaurants. But the nice thing there is it works. Immediately, light would go through. And then because it's unlike air that, you know, when you have a hole in the roof, the light will travel straight. Once it hits the water, it bends. And so the whole 35 square meter house is well lit. It's great for uh, small kinds of shops because instead of spending it on light, you spend it on goods. So economies, you have, of course, uh, children that can read inside the house. They don't have to go outside, which is incredibly hot. They stay inside. And at the same time, you can easily see the, the, the difference. The nice thing there is, you know, uh, white light is excellent uh, because it, when, when the body reacts to it, it produces vitamin D, and so people are healthier. So that's it. How do you spread light? How can you be the next NGO 2.0, at no point have we been, at no point has there been more power than it is now. Instead of using the net as a processing center or just to communicate, can you actually empower people, defragment your NGO, wherever you are, find your funds. If you're an individual, get a, a piece of snippets, get a piece of glue, light up your houses. If you're a group, you can come together, build it. If you're a large organization, why not just light thousands of houses in, at the same time? Five minutes, darkness, and then you have light forever. You know why? Because it lasts 10 years. And the nice thing there, it saves about, uh, well, 500 rupees. We've hit, we're going to hit 200,000 lights just this year. 200,000 times five, uh, time, let's say, put it in dollars. 200,000 lights and $10 each, that's $2 million of saving every month. By the end of the year, by one more year, it will be $24 million. You talk about big, expensive solar panels or windmills, plus interest, you find out that actually those things are actually so expensive that your electricity just doesn't go through. This one immediately starts saving. Within five months, we've spread all around the country. We have student groups, we have you know, NGOs, we have prisoners that uh, are actually trying to make a living. So as I said, this is not factory made. This is done uh, in the, in, you know, people that otherwise would not have jobs now have jobs. They're making 50,000 solar bulbs. So the first of, of its kind. We have people that go uh, in, in, in the Philippines and Mindanao, they're places that are unreachable. So we have still our cowboys called rancheros and they go into the mountains with the solar bulbs into the areas that would otherwise be reached. So in India, who knows what it will be? I'm just saying, this is our team from, uh, from Colombia. We're opening up four other, area, four, four other offices around the world. Five months. And now they're lighting houses. Of course, they're incredibly tanned, and so will you when you start in installing it. But the nice thing there is you change people's lives forever.
thank you very much. I just wanted to say, sometimes you think of one person doing a lot of change, but really, it's nothing compared to all of us just doing a little, because everybody put together will create more change in the world than somebody standing, standing in this stage ever will. Thank you, India. Thank you.